So after earning his PhD in economics from the Technical University of Dresden, Persanigan has been the project leader of several international projects uh, in Germany. So um, his research has been published in several, also in several international journals. One of his recent publications is an article on oil price shocks, protests, and the sh uh, shadow economy. So today his lecture uh, will explain the impacts of oil revenues on the size and income on the middle class in Iran. So please, Professor. Thank you, Camila. Thank you very much. Also, uh, say hello and uh, good afternoon to all the participants today. Most welcome to today's meeting uh, on the effects of oil income shocks and the middle class in Iran. Um, as my colleagues in uh, the project Extractivism uh, mentioned, this uh, uh, lecture series uh, is planned to basically communicate different aspects of uh, uh, interaction of natural resources and economic development. Uh, and what I'm focusing on that is how uh, the size of middle class in Iran um, is getting affected by these uh, uh, development in the oil markets. So um, basically, I would like to first start uh, with the uh, agenda of today's talk and uh, uh, how much time I have almost? 45 minutes, okay. So uh, the presentation is based on, the, on a joint research which I co-authored with my colleagues in the uh, uh, University of Tehran, Priyale Dini Khayyam Aziz and my another colleague, uh, Mohamed Habipur. Uh, and uh, basically, um, uh, you can also uh, get more details from this publication in the Journal of Middle East Development, uh, which published uh, in 2021. 20, uh, so I would start with the introduction uh, on the importance of uh, middle class, um, why we should care about um, the drivers of middle class. And then of course, uh, the issue of definition of middle class, what the middle class is, how uh, we do see middle class in the field of economics. Of course, uh, that is a topic which uh, not only economists are interested in that, but also uh, the other scientists from sociology uh, political uh, science and the other fields are also looking and investigating um, the topic of middle class. Uh, so definition and measurement is quite important. So I would uh, uh, present uh, the indicators that we use to uh, measure the size of middle class in this study. Uh, also, I would uh, show it to you how the middle class in Iran has changed over the past decades before revolution and after revolution. And uh, I present our key hypothesis in this study uh, and also uh, the data that we have used and the methodology that we have used to investigate the effects of oil shocks on the size of binoculars in Iran. And uh, uh, following that, I will present the, the main result and conclusion based on that. So um, there has been a big literature on the importance of middle class. Uh, uh, my focus here is its importance for economic development and political development. Um, middle class is said to be uh, quite critical factors for economic growth, especially in the long term, because it's said that the middle class uh, basically provides uh, the pool of entrepreneurs, uh, those who are able to initiate new ideas, innovation, and start their businesses coming usually from the middle class of society. Uh, the values that middle class bring with itself regarding uh, importance of education and accumulation of human capital, uh, the possibility and ability to consume and to save uh, is quite strong among the middle class. The work ethics uh, uh, and these type of uh, values are quite um, um, highlighted uh, when it comes to importance of middle class for the sustainable development. I uh, also mentioned not only saving, but also the consumption uh, power of uh, this part of the society in the term of uh, providing effective demand for uh, goods and services, which is also important for investors and uh, business uh, uh, people um, uh, and diversification of domestic market um, is another issue why we should care about the drivers of middle class. 
Uh, it's not only economic growth, which is uh, said to be important in the context of development of middle class, but also um, the effect that the middle class uh, will have on the development of political institutions. Um, this is the famous, uh, uh, basically, a statement that without the uh, uh, bourgeoisie, uh, basically, democracy uh, uh, is less likely to materialize the modernization theory than in order to uh, rich, um, uh, developed political institution, you need to uh, achieve uh, a high economic growth and expansion of the size of middle class is a critical factor in that. But also within the uh, discourse of median water, uh, the democratization and political openness is more likely when the size of middle class expands and the number of poor people, the poverty declines. Um, and uh, this expansion of middle class and reduction of the uh, poverty in the society uh, transform uh, the preference of the society from the radical redistribution to more engaging in the political um, uh, system. And uh, this development basically reduced the risk of political elites to engage people more in the political power because uh, they are less worried about the uh, uh, the risk associated to this political openness in the term of, um, you know, uh, taking their assets by the people, by the poor people. So uh, it is said, uh, or the assumption in the context of positive effects of middle class on uh, political institution is that the larger middle class has less hunger for redistribution. So uh, the outcome of um, democratization could be also more likely in society that the middle class uh, uh, enjoy uh, faster growth. Um, it's not only that, but as I said, there are also studies which shows that there is significant differences in the term of uh, preferences and attitudes from uh, vulnerable groups of society, those who are basically in extreme poverty, uh, defined by the percentage of population which has income uh, in a per day and per capita of $2, uh, these are classified as extreme poor, uh, but also those who basically has uh, income uh, uh, of uh, per, per day and per capita of $10 and uh, below that uh, is said to be a vulnerable group of societies. Uh, and when um, studies compare you know, how are the differences between vulnerable part of society and the middle class in terms of political concept, in terms of co social concept, environmental concept, they do see significant differences is observed. Then this is statistic is just for illustration, it's not related exactly to the paper, uh, but in line with the, the issue of um, views uh, in different society, comparison here between Iran, Germany, United States by, uh, 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 it's not said to be a, uh, you know, quite the uh, you know, type of comparison, just for illustration, but, uh, there's a question in the World Value Survey, which is a, um, a big project uh, which captures the views and opinions of the people around different topics. But this is a question uh, that the percentage of the respondents which, uh, who agree with the state, and the state makes people income equal. And is, is, this is an essential element in democracy. And you do see that in Iran, um, yeah, still a significant portion of people believe that in democracy, the state, the government, as a responsibility to uh, equalizing the income of the people. Uh, so this uh, demand for redistribution is quite a strong uh, in Iran today. This is the last wave of this survey, which I guess in Iran was in 2020, this survey. Uh, despite the fact that over the past decades in Iran, the percentage of uh, poor people has reduced significantly, the expansion of middle class has been observed, but still uh, the demand for radical distribution is quite a strong. Or this another question which says the government uh, tax the rich and the subsidize the poor, this should be an essential characteristic of democracy. Again, uh, almost 50% of the respondents in Iran believe that uh, in a democracy, an essential part of democracy is that the government tax the rich and subsidize the poor. In the United States, for example, this is only 10%. Uh, Germany is less than Iran, of course, but um, the gap is statistically significant. Now, coming to the contribution of our paper, um, the, the, the earlier studies in the term of resource cares 
has done a good number of uh, works and uh, very interesting research on the effects of uh, oil and dependency on income inequality, distribution of income and poverty and so on and so forth. But uh, we have had the fewer number of empirical studies which focus on the size of middle class. Um, this is related concept to income inequality, but not exactly uh, the same thing because uh, uh, we are looking at the uh, middle 60% of the society and how their income and expenditure are changing. Um, and um, um, so it is related to income inequality, it gets affected by that, but it's not exactly the same thing. So in that sense, uh, our paper or study also contribute to the, uh, um, to the literature on the middle class, both in political science and the economics, uh, but in the context of resource care. So if uh, basically, um, and the resource case, which I mentioned, those who come to uh, my seminar usually know that resource cares, but for those who are not familiar with the resource cares is the thesis that says that the, the countries which are uh, rich in the natural resources in the, in the long term and on average have a slower economic growth. And there are a variety of reasons why these curse is happening, um, corruption, conflict, violence, such as this and things like this. Uh, but also here our focus is you know, what is happening on the middle class of society in the resource rich countries. If you believe that the middle class uh, development is quite important for sustainable development and political development. So it deserves uh, uh, more deeper studies, of course. So our focus uh, is here is Iran, but one can do this for other oil rich economies uh, to find out what are the similarities between Iran and the other oil rich economies and what are the differences. Uh, we are not only focusing on the response of uh, size of middle class to uh, positive oil shocks, but also we try to understand the transmission channels through which uh, oil rents, fluctuation of oil rents affect the size of middle class. So uh, what are those drivers? So that is, uh, I guess this is also quite relevant and important. When it comes to the definition, there is no agreement on what, uh, what is building the middle class. You know, is the people who own a car or the houses that belongs to middle class or uh, the consumption pattern, you know, um, what is middle class and who belongs to middle class. Uh, there are objective measures and the subjective measures. Subjective measure is, you no. Know, we ask you in the survey whether you classify yourself as a low income, middle class, high income, mm -hmm. and you, you have a you no know, feeling about that. Or um, that is one approach to measure the size of middle class. But the, the approach that we select here is based on more objective indicators which could be uh, grouped within the absolute and or relative measure of middle class, right? Uh, the absolute measures you know, try to find out the critical level of income, the lower band and upper band, that if you have that level of income per day and per person, you belong to the uh, middle class based on this income definition, right? Uh, so again, these critical levels, these upper bound, lower bounds of income, um, there is no, um, uh, hundred percent agreement on that. Um, you no, know, depends on the society in a country, from country to another country. These uh, uh, these critical levels are different. Um, there are studies which basically uh, talk about uh, those who are uh, who have an income per day per person from two dollar to thirteen dollar. These people belong to the middle class. Two dollar is selected because this is the poverty line. Uh, in most developing countries and certain dollars is selected as a poverty line in the advanced economies. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, uh, this is defined as the uh, possible range of income that the people in the middle class should have. Another study by Duflo and the colleague in 2008 talked about the percentage of people who have the income per uh, day and per person between two and $10 only. Um, uh, some like Haras uh, basically believes that uh, anything below uh, $10 per day and per person is uh, quite uh, weak. Uh, you are very at the high risk of falling to the poverty, following some uh, negative shocks, uh, pandemic or uh, global financial crisis. So you are uh, quite vulnerable if you just look at the percent of people who have income less than $10. So it goes beyond $10 or $11. Um, and a stop at a level of 100, 110 dollar, uh, and basically this is the portion of population which uh, are classified as the lower middle income, upper middle income, 
and even in some society it reached the people of high income. Um, so, um, uh, and the, uh, the other studies also uh, start from the tertiary level of $10 per day and per person. Um, so uh, some uh, stop at the upper bound of $50, some like harass goes beyond of that. But I guess uh, when it comes to selecting the lower band for defining who belongs to middle class, this $10 per day per person um, has been used in more studies uh, to define a global middle class, of course, adjusting for uh, purchasing power parity, differences in the cost of living in different countries. Uh, the PPP that you see here is purchasing power parity uh, because you know you have uh, subsidies in some countries. So purchasing power of one dollar is different in um, Iran than in maybe Germany due to these significant subsidies on energy subsidies, food subsidies, and things like this. So purchasing power could be different, uh, and you uh, after this adjustment. Uh, basically, this is defined as a middle class. So we follow when it comes to absolute measure, the Haras definition is something that we follow it here. And the relative measures, again, uh, this was the absolute measure that you, you know define critical level. And if you are positioning yourself in uh, these critical levels, you are middle class in absolute term. Um, and as you can see, the income will not change in the absolute term. So either you are about $10 or not, but the percentage of people who enter to this income range would be different from one year to the next year. You know? So the size of population, so therefore we call it the size of middle class. The number of people who from one year to the next year are in middle class or in the poverty and things like this, they are changing in response to macroeconomic shocks. Uh, but the relative measures basically look at if we have the household income uh, for the people in your society and you sort them from low to the top or from the top to the low. So the middle 60% of these um, uh, population, uh, their share of income and expenditure in the total income and expenditures. So that would be a relative definition of middle class. So that means you are excluding the top 20% and the bottom 20% of households. Those who are quite rich and those who are quite poor or relatively poor. So you look at what is happening in the middle of 60% of the population. And what is the changes in the share of income and expenditures over time? So uh, the size is always the same. It's the middle, middle 60 percent, but their income share and expenditure share this time will change. So uh, compared to the absolute measure, right? So in our study, we use the absolute and relative measure for robustness checks. Uh, when it's come to absolute measure, as I said, we follow the Haras uh, database, which is now updated. Uh, the older database of Haras is available online in the uh, Brookings Institute website, but uh, he has updated uh, by using a more recent PPP terms. Um, so uh, the argument is, uh, you know, we start by $10, as I said, is sufficiently secure to consume this percentage of population is able to save for the future, have ambition for better life, uh, for them and the future and the children, the next generation. So this is a part of society which has the possibility uh, for a more sustainable consumption and the same. Um, so who belongs to this the definition of middle class? So what type of people, categories of jobs uh, basically uh, could fall in this range? Uh, uh, those who are working for the government, public sectors, medical uh, specialists, uh, university professor or lecturers are uh, uh, often said to be, uh, as I said, after adjustment for inflation and purchasing power parity and things like that. So this is just a, some examples who could be uh, usually in this definition. So uh, in that sense, uh, so that is the relative measure which I just mentioned. Now coming to the uh, development of middle class according to the Haras definition, right? Uh, before revolution, after revolution, during the war, after the war, during the sanctions, and so on and so forth. And uh, what is the correlation, co-movement between the size of middle class in Iran and the development of oil revenues? Because that is the focus of our study. You know, what happens to the size of middle class if there is a positive shock in the oil revenue, if there is an oil boom uh, or a negative shock? Uh, uh, which one can maybe conclude it uh, from this is not indirectly because our focus is positive oil shocks. Um, this is the picture of development of um, 
uh, the size of midday class, which is in the blue line, and the, the other one, the orange one, is showing the development of oil income per person adjusted for, again, inflation. Um, so it's a real oil price, uh, oil income per, uh, per person, right? Uh, on the right axis, you see that in the logarithmic transformation. On the left axis, vertical axis, you see the percentage of people who are classified uh, as a middle class people. Uh, definition of harass those who are between $11 per day per person until uh, 111. So uh, before the revolution, uh, you see a significant increase uh, in the uh, oil uh, income, uh, the result of significant uh, uh, growth in the price of oil in the 1974, um, uh, we experienced a substantial increase in the oil revenues of Iran. And at the same time, the plan of the Shah Pahlavi uh, was a fast modernization of the economy um, and the significant internal migration in Iran from rural areas to urban areas, the expansion of infrastructures and you know, other, other things, uh, which resulted to a, a bigger number of urbanization and more percentage of people uh, funding themselves in the middle class uh, defined in the income terms. So uh, revolution, the war in 1979, um, eight year war, as you see, resulted to a significant reduction of both Iranian oil revenues and the size of middle class. Uh, so either um, uh, they fall to the poverty, it's not uh, unusual to see that the people uh, during the war uh, situation, uh, they lose their jobs, uh, the infrastructure are destroyed, investment has declined, there is a capital flight, the people uh, leave the country, uh, there was a significant uh, uh, migration, uh, either as a migrant or as a refugees during the war, uh, especially those who had the capital, the capital owners also left Iran after the revolution. So, and the middle class who were uh, able to find a career or to do further education in living in Iran. So those who remain, of course, uh, was a bigger size of middle class and those who find themselves more uh, in the category of vulnerable part of the society. Uh, oil income, of course, was on decline during the war uh, and uh, uh, up to the 1990. So during the Rafsanjani government, the privatization, liberalization resulted to, uh, again, uh, expansion of investment and capital formation, and more engagement of the people in the job market, female education, um, significant uh, uh, policy uh, for the family uh, control, the size of fertility decline, and there were more resources available for uh, saving and consumption, right? Um, Khatami period, uh, observe again, a significant increase in the size of middle class, uh, uh, associated with also increasing the income per capita from the oil production. Uh, Khatami was very much also open for um, uh, globalization, uh, reformist government, more engagement of the uh, women also in the society, uh, so famous for its reformist policies. And during the Ahmadinejad, uh, of course, the process of expansion of middle class increased. So he also implemented significant national uh, reforms in the subsidy projects. Uh, so the cash transfer helped to reduce income inequality for the first time in a, uh, in a significant way during Ahmadinejad government. And uh, when the poor, uh, basically the number of poor decreased, that means part of them moved to the uh, middle, middle income and middle class uh, from the income perspective, of course. And then uh, um, uh, during the Rouhani, uh, we do observe that the sanction, as you see, the oil income also drop. Uh, the process of economic development distorted as a result of uh, substantial economic sanction after the Obama in 2012 uh, oil embargo, uh, which then stopped during the 2016 and 17 as a result of the agreement with, between Iran and the other power, and then uh, the sanction under the Trump. Of course, our, our sample period this year ends in 2017. Uh, but uh, I have some more statistics which shows 
that during the Trump sanctions, um, uh, the percentage of people who uh, uh, was under the $10 per day per person increased during the sanctions. Um, this is one of those indicators. This is uh, showing the share of population living on less than $10 per day per person. Uh, so this is the so-called vulnerable group of society. Uh, the data that we have here is from 1986 to 2019. And uh, you do see uh, some points of time during the uh, war period in the 80s, uh, almost 70% of Iranian population uh, was below $10 per day per person, uh, adjusted for inflation, the uh, differences in the living costs between country and PPP term. This has declined over time and has reached to a level of 40%. So if we compare this one with the Karas data, which shows that the size of middle class in Iran in the recent years, it's almost 60% of population. This is uh, reflected also here, 40% below $10 are excluded. Uh, so that means these 60% are middle class, but not only the middle class, or some percentage of really high income also included in that. Uh, but um, this shows uh, still 40% uh, of the Iranian population. Now, you see there are some uh, two peaks uh, when the uh, when you observe it here more closely, there is one increase during the first round of the sanction to the Obama and the European Union. And the second meaningful, more substantial increase in the vulnerable group of people is under the Trump sanction after 2017, 2018. Uh, so, um, this is also observed, this increase in the case of extreme poverty, how it defines the share of population living below uh, the tertiary level of $2.15 per day per person. Um, and uh, you do see, of course, uh, we see a couple of uh, developments in after revolution that uh, significant decline in the extreme poverty uh, after uh, revolution, uh, or after 1986, that we do see it here, sometimes in the 80s, this was more than almost close to 10% of population below this level. This has declined uh, almost to close to zero in the, some past years, but now has increased also to uh, almost uh, 1%. So um, this increase is again observed after the sanction, right? Um, before the sanction, this was approached almost to zero. So 1% um, of the uh, Iranian population, according to these statistics, are living in, in the extreme poverty. Um, and for some other Middle Eastern countries, well, this is higher. For example, if you look at the Egypt, um, this is a, a bit more, more than Iran. But uh, this decline in this is not unique only to Iran. This is more or less in uh, majority of countries around the world. Um, uh, this decline has observed, this is a good news, but we do see some not very promising development in the last uh, years, especially during the sanctions in Iran in terms of um, increasing poverty and reduction of the middle class. So uh, this is um, a global map which shows the distribution of countries in a term of size of middle class population. Uh, you see Iran is belong to the category which 40 to 60 percent of its population are um, positioned in the middle class. It is comparable to some other countries, including um, Russia and some other Latin American countries. You see the majority of uh, uh, other countries in Africa, for example, uh, have a small size of middle class. So either uh, the category of uh, less than 20% of the population or uh, 20 to 40 percent of population, but majority of them are in, in the first category, right? Um, the same for India or even uh, China at the moment. This is the average of 2000 to 2012. So uh, the size of media class in China is expected to increase also significantly in India and significantly in future. Uh, these are the emerging economies. Uh, which uh, basically are uh, you know, increasing significant improvement in the welfare, economic welfare, as a result of more engagement in international market. Um, in some countries like Canada, you see 80 to almost 100 percent are classified as those who are uh, middle class or higher than middle class. 
So already, and most part of Europe as well, you know. So now coming to our hypothesis, what we want to test here, what we want to examine in this paper, or uh, what is our claim here, uh, which needs to be tested, which uh, according to that uh, slide that I show, Haras definition of middle class with the development of oil income, it turns out that there's a positive relationship between oil income and the size of middle class in Iran. Um, to what extent this, uh, you know, uh, positive uh, correlation remains if we control for other drivers of middle class. This is something that we need to investigate. Um, so, uh, and uh, of course, correlation is not telling us uh, what will happen on the size of middle class in response to a positive shock, unexpected positive development of oil income. This requires a different methodological approach to investigate. So, but the hypothesis is following the response of Iran's middle class size. Uh, to positive oil income shocks is a positive, uh, you know, controlling for other factors such as paribus. And to test this hypothesis, uh, and of course, in the next step, we try to understand the transmission channel of this effect, if this effect is positive. Uh, we use the annual data from 1965 to 2017, um, uh, following the database of Haras. And uh, when we use, of course, relative measure of uh, middle class, we focus on after revolution because we had this data after revolution, but that is uh, already included in the paper. So I focus more on the result of absolute measure here. The, the oil income per capita uh, is basically is the value of total oil production divided by the size of population. So per person, how much oil income is available adjusted for inflation. Um, and so this is basically the real oil income per person. So the data base is for this data is OPEC organization, the World Bank. The Haras definition, as I just uh, already explained, um, is basically looking at the household which uh, enjoy a certain minimum of economic security. Um, that is the condition to be included as the middle class. So that therefore this tertiary level of 11 uh, dollar per, per per day and per person is defined. Um, the upper bound uh, is set to uh, basically reach the middle class in more advanced economies, but includes also the higher income in developing countries. So it's somehow mixed with the high income in developing countries, not basically if somebody in Iran earn a uh, hundred dollar per day per uh, uh, per day and per capita term, it is basically the uh, enjoy a, a good uh, living, I guess, on huh? the that you come from Iran. It's very as well as they already rich. So, but that is a probably a percentage which is uh, not very big in Iran. So one can say it, it approximates this Karas definition, really those who are in a secure middle class in Iran. Now, of course, I said transmission channels are also important. It's not only oil which affects the size of middle class, Oil affects something else, and that something else affects the size of the gas, right? So uh, we want to uh, also say something on these channels, otherwise it could be quite simple. Um, uh, simple in a term that we uh, want also to learn more beyond, you know, uh, what is the response of middle class to the development of oil revenues. The channels are also important, so therefore we select a few of them in this study. The foreign international trade, because the imports in Iran has a significant also participation of private sector in bazaar, uh, not export because the export, the non-oil export is still quite limited or it's not a significant part of total export. When you say 70% of the total export is oil export. Um, so probably uh, non-oil export is not a significant um, business still, maybe under the sanction this increase because you have uh, not much investment in the oil fields or the oil embargo that pushed the government to increase the private sector in the non-oil export. Um, but still, the imports is a quite significant um, player in the foreign trade of Iran and the bazaar. Um, so uh, that is probably one channel of expansion of the middle class. Again, middle class is a class which is consuming and saving. Private investment in the urban real estate. Again, the investors in the real estate, uh, uh, if the oil affects positively these type of investors and the size of middle class expands in response to increase in the investment in real estate, 
uh, this is probably a, a plausible channel and we know uh, a significant number of people in the oil-based economy is working in the service sector, in the non-tradable sector, and uh, it's quite um, uh, attractive for the investor in real estate in Iran because of its high profit margin. And uh, uh, it doesn't need much also human uh, skills, resources, skill education, and so on and so forth. So you need to have uh, basically uh, money and uh, know uh, what to do with that in the real estate. Um, fertility rate is included here as a measure of uh, you know, uh, demographic indicators. You know, if the oil rents, development of oil rents result to some changes in the fertility rate of family planning, uh, so uh, uh, you have a demographic burden in the economy, you have less resources to um, spend on education, infrastructure, uh, markets, and so on and so forth. So there are arguments to also control for the demographic indicators. GDP per capita, of course, a, a stage of economic development, uh, how oil affects your overall economic performance, that is also important to uh, be investigated and the media class responding to this development of uh, economy. If there's a sanction, if there's a pandemic, uh, nothing to do with the oil maybe, uh, but uh, media class respond to these shocks to your overall economy. Um, or if the effects of oil on the media class works through its effects on the overall economic performance. So we have, again, resource scarce, dust disease and things like this which is not uh, the oil and the middle class, is about oil and the economic performance. Uh, quality of political institution also is important, how oil rents affect political institutions and how uh, middle class responds to this development of me, uh, political institutions. So there's a significant literature also on that part. And we also control for uh, dummy variables. That means we also control for the situation of revolution, the change in the regime, because our sample is sought from before revolution and after revolution, and also war, uh, uh, war condition with Iraq was also a unique condition, so one needs to keep it as a exogenous um, uh, variable in our analysis. The VAR model is selected from methodological point of view. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this uh, methodology, uh, which basically assume all variables in this model are endogenous. So all of them are affecting each other with some lags. So uh, we are uh, less concerned in this methodological approach to assume for exogenity. So uh, oil affects media class, uh, political institution affects media class, media class development affects um, uh, economic growth. And so uh, basically uh, everything affects the other variables, but with some lags. Uh, and uh, you need to decide basically uh, what is the shock variable and what is the response variable in uh, in this setup? So for our own exercise, uh, we select the oil rents as a shock variable. So we give the shock to the oil rents and our response variable is the size of middle class. So basically the VAR model estimates uh, a dynamic um, or tries to learn um, a history of dynamic relationship in our variables over the past decades. You know, we have the data from 1960s to the recent time. So, and try to basically simulate what will happen on response variable, which in this scenario is a, a middle class, if a shock happened today on the oil rates. So based on this historical experience and the dynamics that the model learns, try to simulate and predict the future development following the initial shocks. So this is the philosophy of the, uh, uh, in a very short, uh, seeing uh, what the VAR model, why we have selected the VAR models. Um, now coming to the results, um, uh, now this is our main result, the response of Iran media class to a positive oil income shocks. Uh, and what you see here, the solid middle line basically is the response of our response variable uh, to a shock, a positive shock in the oil income. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you do see the number of years following the shock in future. If the shock happened today, how the media class response to this shock in the forthcoming period. So we have selected 10 years uh, in future um, to see if there is a positive significant uh, shock to the oil revenues per person. Basically, how the size of media class uh, no, uh, develop. It is positively responding or negatively responding. Is it statistically significant or not? 
Uh, by statistical significance, I mean these error bands, these dashed lines that you do see here, uh, which shows uh, uh, the confidence interval around these responses. So if these dashed lines include the, um, the uh, horizontal, uh, the, uh, sorry, the zero line, uh, this zero line, uh, we say that uh, we have no evidence for a statistically uh, significant of a response. So the response could be also zero if the error bands include the zero line. So uh, in our scenario, uh, in this case, so there is a significant positive response of media class to a positive shot in the oil in case of Iran. And this response is quite persistent and remains significant until the end of our period of analysis until the, uh, the year of 10. So um, how we should read it, basically, uh, I've summarized the meaning of or the size of impact. So we learned that the response is positive. The direction of response of media class to positive oil shock is positive, it react positively and remains significant over the last, uh, over the next 10 years following the initial shock. The peak of response in, uh, in the third year following the initial shock. So you see uh, it reached its peak and then declined further. Um, we have done a few uh, algebra here calculation, uh, and we come to this uh, you know, summary and conclusion that an increase of 35% in oil income per capita is leading to an increase of 4% the size of middle class, the share of population after three years following the initial shock. So um, um, you know, observing 30%, uh, 35%, 40% percent increase in the oil income is feasible. Uh, in these very volatile oil markets that Iran has, or the you know, oil market has, you know, sometimes uh, there is a financial crisis and the oil prices drop, there's a pandemic drop, there is maybe a war in Ukraine, and then it increased significantly. So it is a sanction in Iran that increased. Uh, there's a war in Middle East that increased, and they are very volatile. Uh, volatile huh? And uh, you no, know, having an expected uh, thirty percent, twenty percent increase in the oil is not something unfeasible, uh, at least in our sample. So uh, the response of uh, size of media class is quite meaningful and significant to this uh, shock. And uh, uh, this is uh, based on a calculation: is the amount of the response is also four percent. So um, now, uh, how we can explain this positive response of middle class to the positive shock in the oil in Iran? Uh, we try to find out what are the channels through which the oil income affect the size of middle class positively. So we start with the trade, foreign trade, as I said, the imports of commercial goods are, are said to be a, a part of type of activities which engage a significant number of people from private sector. Um, and uh, if the imports respond positively to the positive oil shocks and the middle class size of middle class also respond positively to the positive shocks in the imports, then of course we can claim that we have identified the channel of effect. No, oil affects the uh, trade, foreign trade in imports and import development result to uh, a positive reaction of the size of middle class. So uh, through that, probably we have one step further in understanding the causal mechanism here. So here is the response of imports to a positive shocks in the oil in Iran. So you do see that the response is significant, positive. It peaks um, uh, in the first year following the shock, so the, the middle line peaks and then fall, but it remains positive until the end of period. The next nine years after the initial shocks, it seems that if there is an oil boom, the foreign trade and imports rationally uh, is welcoming that development. There's more businesses happening when in oil-based economy, there's oil price increases, there's more investment happening, there's more consumption and more demand, more effective demand, the household income will increase and they consume more. And so the import section is uh, a part of business which respond positively to oil boom. Uh, so this is the response of middle class to positive shocks in the imports. The middle class also welcome, um, uh, basically is happy with the expansion of the foreign trade. A significant portion of people who classify as the middle class uh, are linked directly or indirectly with service sector. And one of the service sector which is pushing or booming uh, middle class is the people who are working in bazaar, in imports, 
and so on and so forth. So the response is positive, remain positive and significant until the end. Now, since that we talk about service sector, the uh, imports, of course, focusing on imports, but the service sector is more than that. Uh, the public sector is something that we also have uh, look at that. You know, the size of service uh, sector includes banking, finances, uh, include real estate, uh, includes those who are working for government administration, um, retail market in bazaar, those who are working in the foreign trade in the private sector, all of them are part of service sector. And we do see a significant increase in the service sector after the end of war with Iraq. Um, this is the trend of uh, value added of service sector in billion dollar uh, adjusted for inflation. And you see, uh, of course, uh, uh, I present from 1960 to 2020, the data. Uh, the expansion of service sector already started in the 70s during the Shah Pahlavi. Um, thanks again to increase of oil money, petrodollars increased significantly, urbanization, migration of people from rural areas to cities, and more consumption. And that is also associated with the expansion of middle class in Iran uh, a few years before revolution. The revolution and the war resulted to decline of service sector or uh, uh, not necessarily decline in that sense, but it stopped the growth of service sector um somehow but the growth of service sector uh, uh, restarted after the end of the war in 1988 during khatami and hashemi rafsanjani khatami and ahmadinejad and it has reached a number that you see here 240 billion us dollar compared to 71 billion us dollar at the end of the war with iran so now response of service sector to a positive shocks in the oil revenues is positive and significant and uh, uh, following that, the response of middle class size to the positive shock in the service sector is significantly positive, right? Uh, so uh, uh, probably one of the channels through which oil money affects positively the size of middle class is the expansion of service sector. And we have in the literature of resource cares also the issue of dust disease. That means in the long term, the countries which are Rich in the natural resources, experience uh, deindustrialization, uh, demanufacturization, and the resources, capital, and labor, uh, you know, transfer from trade sector, manufacturing, agriculture to non trade sector, including services. And uh, knowing that the significant portion of employment is also in the service sector, this is not surprising that middle class, defined uh, following this income definition, um, uh, grow significant the service sector expands. So this is uh, the trend of employment in service, a percentage of total employment in Iran from 1991 to 2019. And you do see now uh, the last statistics show that 50, more than 50% of total employment in, in Iran are in the service sector. And the remaining 50% are in manufacturing, agriculture, industry, and so on and so forth. So that means service sector is really a very crucial part of the economy in terms of job opportunities and income opportunities, which is uh, important for definition of middle class. And um, over the last years during the sanction, of course, the, the service sector has become more important because uh, uh, the, the market of service sector in Iran is more local rather than international markets. And it is more um, uh, resistant against the uh, international sanction um, totally different than industry manufacturing oil industry, which was much more vulnerable uh, with reference to sanctions. The service sector um, uh, did resist uh, against the sanctions. Now, um, uh, it's also important when you talk about these uh, channels, of course, the economy itself, uh, how it responds to uh, positive oil shocks and how the size of media care responds to overall economic performance is also quite important as uh, uh, possibly one of the uh, reasons why media class uh, grow following the oil boom. And uh, there are also studies listed here which show that the size of media class is positively correlated with the higher uh, economic development, right? There are more business opportunity, investment opportunity, trade opportunity when the economy is booming. And um, uh, so it is interesting to find out how economy in Iran, in the term of GDP gross domestic product, react to the positive oil shocks in the short term, the long term. 
uh, we learn from resource guests that the response in the long term is negative. So uh, they have more harder time to increase their income per capita in the oil-based economies. There's a positive oil development because of no high risk of conflict, high risk of corruption, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but in the short term, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean these two need to be negative. We do see that the response of GDP per capita in Iran in the short term, within the first year, the first two years, following the positive oil shock is positive significant. The response uh, approaches zero and becomes also negative uh, in the middle term and the long term. So this is in line with what the resource curse also uh, predicts that in the long term, basically these resource rich countries have more problems and troubles to manage these um, higher oil revenues. They need more strong institution than the normal scenario to manage these substantial increase in the rents. So, but in the short term, um, it's a blessing also for Iranian economy. Um, so they enjoy uh, and they welcome the oil. But the point is there's a significant more resist persistent response of middle class to positive changes in the GDP per capita, right? Um, the response is quite meaningful, substantial, remain positive, significant until the uh, until almost the end of our uh, period of simulation. So uh, there is a substantial positive uh, response of uh, size of middle class to a positive shock in the GDP, uh, which could be uh, uh, driven by uh, positive changes in the oil revenues. But we said the linkage between oil rents and the Iranian economic growth is relatively short term and weak. But if there is a other reasons which basically result to a more substantial positive development of economic growth, like lifting of sanctions or uh, you no know, ending of COVID pandemic restriction, then the size of media class response to that positive shocking income per capita, not directly related to the oil, uh, is more substantial, sustainable. So uh, finally, the last channel that I looked was the, the role of political institutions, how oil rents affect political institutions and how development of political institutions reflect in the development of middle class. And um, this is also quite important because there's a big uh, literature, especially those who are in the political science on democratization, the role of middle class, uh, Professor Roiza, has already also investigated this in some of the Middle Eastern economies. Um, and also the role of media class in Europe at the time of uh, industrial revolution, how uh, expansion of media class uh, resulted to demand for political participation and engagement. Whether this is also the case in the oil rich economies, uh, this has been investigated uh, a lot. So we have also looked at this story in the case of Iran and oil base economy. Um, and uh, what we found is, uh, uh, is uh, as following, our analysis shows that the response of quality in the quality index is a measure of um, uh, democratic institution, right? Uh, is, uh, no, the definition of democracy has a different definition. Those who are working on the literature on democratization, democracy, how we define democracy, what the democracy is, um, is it uh, you know, uh, only going and vote, uh, participation in election, or political competition, or um, this is um, um, uh, uh, other, other aspects of democracy and so on and so forth. So we do use the index of quality, which is basically uh, a degree of competition at the executive level, the degree of political competition, and also check and balance system on the government. Uh, how the government is accountable, competitive, and so uh, these issues. So um, it is uh, in the range of minus 10 to plus 10. So if a country is scored minus 10, is by the way, is a subjective indicator. It's based on perception of experts. Um, so it's not based on the number of people who go to vote or the number of uh, the, uh, seats that the political party in the parliament has or the competition. Uh, that is not like that. This is based on the country experts' views. They know how the government is competitive in that country, in that country, based on some criteria, right? Uh, which is a criteria that you understand that democracy should work like this. 
So uh, in that sense, uh, um, we use this polity index from minus 10 to plus 10. So plus 10 is a full uh, democracy, minus 10 is a full autocracy. And you have a large number of countries in between, you know, um, semi-democracy, factional democracy, uh, mature democracy, and so on and so forth. So um, what we found out is the response of quality index in Iran as a measure of quality of democratic institution to a positive oil revenues shock is negative, but is statistically insignificant. So uh, that is in line with our uh, no expectation from the resource guest literature that shows that in the resource rich country, if the oil money increases, if there's a positive oil shocks, um, usually you have a type of distortion, in the fiscal relationship between the people and the government you know, the government becomes more independent from uh, taxes and social contribution. Now it's richer in terms of two dollars. And uh, there is less need to be accountable on one side and um, uh, less need also the money of the people uh, for financing administration. And the other side also the people uh, uh, might found it uh, not very uh, far from uh, optimum uh, to um, you know, tolerate that political system or not engage in the political system in return to pay a fewer amounts of taxes and even in return receive a significant subsidies and public jobs and things like this. So this social contract uh, and unwritten social contract exists in the oil rich economies that on one side the tax burden is low, the amounts of subsidies by the government is high, the public jobs is also available. Uh, more easier. Uh, on the other side, um, uh, the government is not willing to uh, open the political system and to share the political power to the people. So that's the type of uh, equilibrium in which that these social contract result to um, uh, persistence of autocratic system in the oil-based economies, as long as money is available to finance the social contract. So if there is a sanction, if there is a pandemic, uh, which the government is not anymore able to continue the subsidies and needs to collect more taxes now, uh, then that social contract would be uh, very at a high risk so that people start to, you know, uh, logically to question you know, what you do with these taxes. If you pay the taxes, we want something from you and more accountability and so So, but that is the case that the positive oil shocks result to a distortion reduce the share of taxes, reduce the accountability of the system, and the government becomes less and less democratic. So the response that we do see in the case of Iran is showing this negative response. Whenever there is a positive oil shock, the government in Iran basically becomes uh, less accountable, also domestically and internationally becomes more challenging. You know, at the time of Ahmadinejad, that Iran experienced a significant increase in the oil revenues, maybe in the history of uh, Iran uh, was unique increase in the oil revenues of his government. Uh, he started, for example, to challenge international power on his atom program. Even he started to, you know, debate the Holocaust and say this uh, is not uh, maybe a uh, historical fact. So on issues which basically none of the earlier presidents of Iran <laughs> uh, were engaged in that level. So he started to be very looking for adventures and, uh, you know, challenging the global power, partly because of these uh, nice uh, uh, reserves of oil revenues, which make him possible to be a challenger. And whenever oil uh, revenues drop, the government starts to think, you know, how to finance its administration, they need not tax it. So you cannot tax the people without giving them something, without showing some flexibility and engagement. Even the government of Khatami, which came to the power, Iran has very, very historically low level of oil income. The oil price per barrel was uh, around $8 or something like that. And that was the significant pressure on the state to, you know, to initiate some reforms, social reforms, in order to engage more uh, participation of the people in uh, business and investment and uh, you know, to finance also the government. Uh, and that uh, also, means that the government through these reforms try to win the trust of the people to the system and uh, add to its social capital, uh, political capital. So uh, that is facilitated by a negative oil shocks. Um, this is basically 
Uh, but the response of quality index to this is not surprising to see that the response to positive oil shock in Iran is negative. So democracy did not welcome um, uh, the de positive development of oil. Uh, but the response of middle class, if we assume that there is a positive shock in the political institution of Iran, um, the response of middle class to positive shocks in the, the democratic institution is quite uh, low, almost zero, and uh, insignificant. So that means in Iran, uh, there is no uh, uh, significant interaction between development of middle class and development of political institutions. Um, partly this weak relationship uh, maybe due to this fact, the expansion of middle class in Iran that we observe uh, has experienced significant increase, uh, especially after the revolution, after the end of war. Now, 60% of population are defining the middle class. Um, this expansion of middle class has less interaction with the development political system in Iran, partly because um, uh, the economic existence uh, of these people in the middle class linked to the distribution of the resource rents. So uh, their financial uh, situation is not independent from the decision of government how to distribute the rents, public jobs, public employment, subsidies, cash transfers, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are talking about the middle class, which is in this class of society in income terms, but um, it's not financially independent from the state transfers. And uh, as long as that you are financially depends on the system, you are not necessarily going to challenge that system in a significant and meaningful way. So middle class can be engine of political democratization if it's financially is able to finance itself um, to a large extent and is not, uh, its existence is not linked to what the government decides and so on and so forth. And uh, in Iran, that type of middle class seems to be uh, relatively marginal and uh, insignificant. Now coming to uh, basically, uh, so this is what I mentioned. Now conclusion, um, we examine in this study if and how the size of middle class in Iran has been affected by the flow of oil income. So that is uh, not, uh, clear from beginning if there is a positive significant response of middle class to all shocks, so that needs to be investigated. And then when verified that is the case, we need to also find out through which channels this positive response of middle class has been uh, achieved. Now, um, of course, we have control for these channels. Uh, we found out uh, that the response is positive, so middle class enjoys uh, a, a significant increase in the oil. So when there is an oil boom, the size of middle class also expands with that. So we can talk about oil-based middle class expansion, which when we agree on that, this is not going to be a challenger politically uh, for uh, political openness, for revolution, for uh, basically these type of substantial changes in the politics. We need the type of middle class which is able financially um, to survive without the support of uh, state uh, in, in, the, in a significant way. So this is not only the phenomenon in the, uh, Iran, in most oil rich economies, basically the expansion of middle class has no significant relationship with the uh, democratization. So that is by the way, what the Herwaiza is also presented in uh, one of his articles in Meta Journal. Uh, that this middle class in the Irish economy is different than middle class than uh, that time of Europe. Uh, so uh, there is not big hope. And that is not surprising that if there are protests in some of these countries, um, uh, the engagement of middle class in the protests is um, not uh, quite significant, at least uh, up to recent protests in Iran the earlier waves of protests, you, you do see more, mostly uh, the people who were engaged uh, with, uh, from the vulnerable group of society. Um, the main transmission channel for the oil income shock in the size of media in Iran, I said import service sector and the overall economic development, right? These three channels. Um, quality of political institution is not getting affected by expansion of media class and vice versa. And that's it. This is, a, this is the summary of the papers in a non-technical 
things in the economic research from as a policy brief, policy report, which together with Kuyala Dini from University of Tehran, we prepared there and uh, in, I guess in 2000 words. So if you don't have time to read the full paper, so you might read this, which is also open access. So uh, that was the story of oil and middle class. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, I would be happy to answer your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.